Thomas Jefferson said, a well-informed electorate is a prerequisite for democracy. The following program is part of the series, Influencers and Media Makers. A number of years ago, CCTV sat down with some of Vermont's most influential voices in media, news, and information access to understand their perspectives about the role of media in democracy and how their decisions shape the way we as Vermonters receive information. Much has changed since our first interviews. The people, the technology and social media, the political landscape, and so much more. Fast forward 20 or so years, and in collaboration with Leadership Champlain, we are revisiting the topic with a focus on what has changed, gaps and challenges across geographic, language, and socioeconomic boundaries. The conversations you will hear with today's gatekeepers provide important, varied, and insightful context to the media in Vermont today. Enjoy. I think where we wanted to kind of start with your section mm. is just a bit about Vermont Cast, so people have a good idea in, in your words um, about what it is, because Ben actually was able to provide a lot of the background. Right. Um, and you know how this was born out of uh, local paper owners, Marion and Paul, right? And, and just kind of going from there, and the content you are involved with specifically, and mm -hmm. how that fills out the Vermont Cast programming. Right. So, so you're asking about my journey with Vermont Cast? Yes. Okay. And then, this will be edited. Yeah. Don't okay. feel yeah. free to ramble and No, I pause. just was like, where am I saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and yeah. and even yeah, about yourself too and how you yeah. came to be with Vermont Cast would be great. Right. So I think one of the beauties of Vermont Cast is that it does parallel kind of the evolution of communication and the shifting of priorities that the pandemic served as a catalyst for. And I think it was a perfect storm of a lot of things. So personally, I worked in the performing arts industry before this and you didn't have any performing arts uh, during the height of the pandemic. So I did my introspection of what sparks joy within me, what do I think my purpose is and it is to group to create these screenshots of emotions and moments to share that people can connect with. And if that sparks star log, that's fine. If that is just something that someone finds beautiful or interesting, that's fine. But I just wanted to use the power to frame how I see things so people can also see it because representation matters. And I understand that my voice and the way I see things is not something that is very apparent in a lot of media. It's not, you know, when you turn on the TV, the percent chance of seeing someone who sees the way I do and creating media the way that I create media is like, I don't know, maybe we're at a good 7%. I'm gonna be nice, we're at a 7% chance, but it's still not high. And I think as I developed my voice as an artist and I saw the uh, Indeed, you know, article being like, hey, wanna work for this company, I was just like, yeah, that sounds amazing. And so I met with Marianne and Paul. They actually came to my studio back when it was still like barely, you know, cobbled together because I did this all myself in the sense that my friends and my community came together and we, you know, I laid this floor myself. We we picked it up and took it up a flight of stairs and we're like, wow, like 25 square feet of vinyl flooring is actually kind of heavy. <laughs> And, you know, we talked and they talked about their vision of Vermont Cast and how they wanted to highlight the beauty of Vermont, the passions, the underpinnings, the currents and the different perspectives of Vermont. And a lot of times I say to people, it's similar to a ethical version of BuzzFeed, like Vermont's ethical version of BuzzFeed in the best way of here are these pieces that highlight the type of people that are in Vermont. Here are the things that highlight the beauty of Vermont, the trials, the tribulations, the pathways to build this community that is not perfect, but is striving to improve. And we are doing our part to show the human side of that improvement. So that's the reason I joined Vermont Cast, and that's kind of how they found me in that moment where we're just like, wow, the world's like not great. 
and I kind of want to make it a little more great. And I want to do that through media. And then we're like, yeah, let's do it. And they're like, you want to join us? I was like, yeah, let's do it. That's a great origin story. I love that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we were all feeling the pressure and the pain of the pandemic mm -hmm. and somehow along the way I started following along and really yeah. did find a lot of inspiration there. Um, I've also noticed some pieces covering uh, Black History Month was a pretty robust programming. I also noticed you covered the um, amendment to the local city code, removing the gendered language regarding sex work in right. the city. Yeah. Um, can you speak to some of those more pressing issues that you did choose to cover and, and why? Yeah, so it all connects in that I am a multimedia artist. So one of the things I do is that I do burlesque and burlesque is complicated in the way that I often describe it as like the suburbs of sex work that there are people who are full service sex workers who also do burlesque and the foundation of burlesque is sex work. It is tied, the history to it is tied and can never be removed. But where we are now and how people perceive sex work now, a lot of people can just be like, no, I'm just a burlesque dancer, I'm, it's theater. Or, you know, when people talk about pole dancing, they're like, I'm not a stripper, I'm a pole dancer. And you're like, these are our roots, we can't separate this. And I am pro sex work, I'm pro bodily autonomy. And so when these issues came up, I was just like, we need to normalize it, not in the way that we need to sanitize it, you know, where you're like, we're normalizing it in a way that, yeah, you see Rocky Road when you go to an ice cream shop. We're normalizing it in a way where you're like, this is a facet of life. And if I don't interact with it, that's fine, but they're deserving of as much respect as I give the average worker because they are just an average worker. Um, so, as a burlesque dancer, I experience these things more, and especially as a black person who does engage with these types of sex works, uh, I do face the brunt of the oppression and the way that it is dangerous for me. And I understand that we are in Burlington, and so there is a concept of being safer, but we can't, just because it's safer in a physical way doesn't mean that we can just be on the sidelines and not work harder to be better because silence is compliance. You letting people speak illly or not realizing these words carry the weight of their harm is creating further harm. So I was just like, Vermont's, like, Vermont's good, but like, let's get better. <laughs> and so seeing these um, questions pop up, uh, knowing people who are creating pole dancing studios and these burlesque shows, I was just like, this is a normal part of our life. And it's, just as beautiful as us going to, say, uh, a watering hole that's in Vermont. It's just a part of the fabric that connects and builds the character of our community. Wow, very well put. Um, yeah, I, I also love how you don't shy away from the really explicit nature of, of these codes and how they do impact daily Vermonters. Mm -hmm. We spoke to Taylor Small last week about some of the le legislation that she put through. Um, which is sadly now really coming into effect um, yeah. with some recent really harm done to the trans community. Yeah. So I don't think that there's, yeah, there's... Um, Fun fact I'm, about me and Taylor, we're actually friends, and that if you ever go to Taylor's house, you will see one of my paintings in her house. It's a very large painting, so you can't miss it. It's like four feet by five feet or something, incredible. so... <laughs> uh, it's been so great yeah. to see all these connections in the community, and that we're not as separate as um, you know the media would, would want us to think. Um, so getting into kind of the meat of the interview um, that we've been trying to, to gather some of these, mm -hmm. um, these points of interest in local media. Um, and what, what did, I, I noticed in that piece as well about the, ooh, about the, uh, <laughs> that's just, Crack my back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, settle in. We gotta get comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> um, in in the piece about the um, gender language in the mm -hmm. Burlington City Code, um, that you also helped spread the word about how, when, where to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so, what role do you think Vermont Cast plays in voting decisions? Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you decide 
when and how to cover that? So one of the, what I think is a very interesting and part of why Vermont Cast is important and impactful is that it is in a sense decentralized. I was speaking on how Ben is my supervisor, but in a way he operates more as I would say our quarterback on a football team. Like he is our leader, but in a way that we do feel like a team and it's not his way guiding us. It's no, take what you see as a Vermonter and put that first because we are making content for Vermonters. And in essence, your journey is the journey of a Vermonter. So that is how we operate. So when it comes to creating or making these decisions, it's coming from us living and being like, this is important to me right now. I want to make something about this right now. And we know it will resonate because we are creating Vermont content for Vermonters as Vermonters. And so this decentralized way that kind of separates us from the 24 hour news cycle where we're like, okay, what should we make to get these views, to get these things? We're like, no, what is important to us? And we know by fact that as Vermonters creating content, this will be important to someone else. And it's not about the overarching numbers. Um, it's about the community based creation and the language and creating this space in which we are flourishing, which is divesting what we from what is perceived often as traditional media. So when it comes to deciding these things, it's almost as natural as breathing because it's part of our livelihoods. We're taking what we see and how we see it and when we see it and taking these snapshots and putting it through Vermont cast. So, and we know that because we're speaking as people to people, it is a lot easier for us to be like, hey, it's time to go out and vote because it's not an authority figure being like, now at 5 p.m. you must vote. It's more of like, hey, it's almost voting time. Oh my God, I almost forgot. I was like, I know Sam, that's what I'm telling you. So we both vote. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think we touched on that, that na national state versus local um, environment. And building on that, um, how, how do you address um, some of the bias and ideology and some of those more insidious aspects of the wider news? Or, or do you just try to stay in your own lane when you're creating that content? The bias of national news, I think in the sense, I this is going to come from more me personally than from Vermont Cast. I think the fact that I am employed by Vermont Cast and even before this interview, Ben and the team was like, you're speaking as yourself and you speaking as yourself is a reflection of Vermont Cast. So like say what you got to say as you got to say, because that's why we hired you. So speaking as myself. The my existence in all of its facets and all the levels and intersections in which I exist has always put me on the outside of major news because more often than not, the classifications and how I am reported on or how people like me are reported on put me as a villain or put me as unable. The way that we have fat phobia, so they're just like, yeah, you're big because you're unhealthy and you're going to die. I'm like, no, that's not it. Or, yeah, if you raise your voice, you're angry because you're black. And you're like, no, that's also incorrect. So I think my existence and me reporting honestly through my feelings and speaking through the harm, because it's not me falling into respectability politics. It's me saying, I'm existing this is actually how we exist. You see me exist. And, I, and that is what we mean when we say existence is revolutionary. Representation matters because I am not actively fighting them to be like, no, look at me, approve of me. I am existing. And that fact alone, the fact that you, I am being seen and I am not giving you the power to change how I will interact at any point, is us dismantling that system. And while it won't make the huge impact such as systemic changes in laws make, it makes the changes in the grassroots movement of people being like, oh, this person exists and this is normal. It is, the more they see people like me, the more people who are like me can be like, okay, I can do this. They're like, it might be hard, but I know it can be done. 
And then when they do it, it's a little bit easier. And it also proves to those who don't like me that it doesn't matter. Like, I'm so sorry that you hate that I exist, but look at me go. So my existence in itself is how I kind of battle the system. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I notice even just, you know, going about your weekend is often reported on. And do you feel like that is a political act if, given your identity? I think it is in the way, the nuance of that question lies in the crux of because no matter what I do, I will always be politicized. The way these systems are in place and the way that white, suppress white supremacy in itself is a beast that evolves to keep itself in power, that no matter what I do, it is an act of resistance. But the nuance lies in that I do not fight it by trying to change it. I fight it by saying, my purpose in life is to save someone and it is okay if it's just myself. My purpose is to bring joy and me bringing joy to myself is enough and I am very privileged and I am very happy that I can show that act to other people and I can show that my personality type or my idiosyncrasies are as welcomed and they are just as deserving and so yes it's a political act because we live in a system that refuses to show that narrative but I don't politicize it in the way that I'm doing it as an objective. I'm just saying, this is the way it is. And if you, and so if it adds fuel to a fire, that's not my problem because I'm a beautiful tree regardless. Mm. Uh, yeah, getting into the news desert and access section of our interview, um, we define a news desert as community, either rural or urban, with limited access to the sort of credible and comprehensive news and information that feeds democracy at the grassroots level. Um, uh, this can be interpreted so many different ways, though. Mm -hmm. Everyone we've interviewed has had such a different take on what they visualize as a news desert in mm -hmm. Vermont. Sometimes it's geographical, sometimes mm -hmm. it's socioeconomic, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's technological. Mm -hmm. um, have you had a chance to think about kind of the landscape of Vermont and who mm -hmm. has access to media mm -hmm. and how Vermont cast and how yourself as a creator kind of contributes or um, mm -hmm. at or least- Or even yeah. recognizes that it exists. Right, so- thank you. No, thank you, yeah. yeah. So when it comes to news deserts, everyone is correct because there, that is the point, not the point, but that is the fact of intersections is that there's so many avenues and ways that things balloon to the issue that it is today. It's a death by a thousand cuts. So socioeconomically, there is an issue um, and that technology is tied to it, but also is separate to it. So all these things come together to create this huge monster. And it is very well and good that each person might attack it differently. And that's why you'll always get a different answer because there's so many facets to bring it down. Because once again, I said it, white supremacy and all these things build upon themselves to create a stronger problem, to make it harder to dismantle, which is why you see it everywhere in every aspect. And I think, Vermont cast recognizes that and I think because it's that human to human approach that makes it more comfortable. So I think the way we access how we show things, being very much ourselves, being very cognizant of who we have as Vermont cast representatives, not saying we need to find someone who is diverse, but saying if they are able and if they are willing to work with us, obviously they can because they are Vermont and we need to recognize that like, yeah, a lot of us who like to ski are gonna wanna make ski content. So Parker, if you're like, hey, we're gonna have a federal duck stamped contest within Vermont cast, yeah, that makes sense. I don't know how it makes sense, but I know it makes <laughs> sense to you, so we're going to do it. And so I think that 
kind of helps with kind of a cultural approach. And then when it comes to a technology approach, while the United States has one of the highest access to social media, it is still not perfect. And we recognize it's not perfect, but we also recognize that it's easier for someone to access Instagram than it may be to access a news channel, that maybe they can only access our TikTok and our Instagram and they don't have the ability to go to a website. So we have different lengths of time. We have different avenues technologically that, you know, if someone's at the library, they can access the website, easy peasy, or easier peasier. Um, if someone has a cell phone, if they have Wi-Fi, they can access us. So while it's not perfect because we can't fix technology because that's not what the power we have, but to make sure within the limitations we can be accessed is great. And then with socioeconomic, I think that is one of the reasons why I do my weekend, we do the weekend rundown and we have people show their own locations because, you know, I am not going to be able to afford to go to a really nice like weekend festival, but I can go to a bookstore. This is, you know, Brook Bay problems. And I think that's another way to kind of create that comfortability or create that like modern language in that it's not taboo to speak on this. And so I think that's how we're operating and that's how we're growing. And as we gain more in the future, because we also have to recognize that Vermont Cast is so new. It started in 2021 and we are just we're technically like four months into 2022, but like, you know, it's still like very new or not even a year old. So to see that this is what we're doing with our bare bones abilities, what we do as we grow as a company with our ethics and our integrity guiding how we create content, I do believe we will have more impact in different ways in the future. Do I know what it is? No, but I know we're gonna do it because I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna be like, why did I do it? <laughs> so great. I hope I answered the question. I might have gone Absolutely. Off. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I know Ben spoke a lot about um, specifically engaging youth, and it seems that these tools that Vermont Cast is using would be really well adapted to that. Yeah. Um, and what do you see as your responsibility um, as a member of Vermont Cast to expand access to diverse audiences? Um, is Vermont Cast focused on that or is that something that's a byproduct of engagement with social media um, and what kind of partnerships do you have with other organizations um, to that end? It is a byproduct that we foster in the, in the way that it's like a garden and we're just like yeah we're building a garden the garden of Vermont cast and then there's like this plant of being like oh we're engaging youth and we can nurture this because I think speaking on systems like how when we go through the U.S. education system currently, the love of reading has been destroyed because of the way it has been so specifically by these types of authors for these types of themes, for these types of tests, and it kind of di takes away the way that people want to read where you're just like, no, you reading comic books is you reading. You reading a romance webtoon, reading. You just engaging in really like people who have very poetic Instagram captions, reading. And I think the way the education system has kind of stripped that and how it is a tool for people to kind of like disengage with news because the 24 hour news cycle, you're just like, this is some big wordy stuff. And like, I know I don't like big wordy stuff because when I was in school, I hated reading. And we're just like, fair, that's true. But also, um, would you like 60 seconds of me using an R2-D2 clip to tell you about the Sci-Fi Expo? Would you like us to like speak to you like a human being at your level respectfully because we are a human first news, news organization? And I think that is why the byproduct is hopefully very apparent or hopefully makes the impact that we think it will because we recognize that this isn't, we're not forcing you to engage. We are your peers engaging with you, bringing you stories that we think you would find interesting because we find it interesting, not because it's something that we assume has to be done. We're aiming for the community, not for the escalator of what we think or what people have propped up to be a media company. So that's our goal. That's our goal just to be a really cool community 
and people being like, yeah, and we're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that social media engagement um, is something that a lot of uh, broadcasters have kind of struggled with to some degree. Um, with not always the most positive spin on on that resource. Um, so let's see. Do you have a relationship with more traditional media sources as a social media maker? And um, do you see, let's see. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, what? What relationship do you have to those traditional media sources, I, I guess, is what I'm getting at there. Mm -hmm. I think it is very similar to my relationship as an artist in that I have been privileged to, you know, I went to Champlain College. I was a creative media major, so I was able to take classes to help me learn a lot of traditional basics. Uh, I have been on the news or worked with organizations uh, it's, it's like one of those things where like, I, it's, it's not weird that it's happened, but the frequency, I'm like, this is a habit that happens. You know, if you were in Argentina in 2014, you probably saw me in news twice for two different reasons and for something with the embassy that I don't remember. If you've been watching the news here, you've probably seen me like randomly out and about, you know, in different pieces being like, oh, Champlain College is breaking ground or, you know. There was a conference with Senator Leahy, and I'm just like, there. And so I think I've had these exposures because of how I've grown up, how I've operated, and the education path I've had, where I got to learn these foundations. And because I just am very joy-focused in that I am trying to live as honestly, as purposefully, and as beautifully as I can, because every step I take, I want the footprints to leave something, like to grow something beautiful behind me. And so with that integrity and that honesty and that focus on creativity, I have been able to be more on new media because I'm just like, I cannot force myself to assimilate to what we know as traditional media because it's not me. I understand it and I can take the lessons to create things so like, I, I know how to work a camera. I learned how to work a camera. I know how traditionally I should work the camera. Am I going to put myself at a MySpace angle because I think it's funnier and it's more relatable and more me and therefore someone's like, this is funny. And I'm like, I know, that's why I made it. So we both think it's funny. I think that um, is how that relationship works for me is that I understand it. I don't want to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I just love that. I guess flipping the perspective and um, that kind of attitude about social media and using it for a force of good. Yeah. Um, do you see any critical challenges to overcome in that goal? Or are there just these bright spots that you've been able to highlight? Everything has ups and downs. And definitely with social media, there is the problem of the digital self versus the in-person self. And I feel like it's easier for me to find the bright spots because once again, I have the education and I've had that privilege to like be able to like parse and dissect those things. But for the average person, we shouldn't expect them to because they have other shit going on. I was like, you didn't go to school for like a master's degree in museum and gallery studies and then read a thesis about like the digital self and dismantling the white cube. That's what I did. So that's why I can talk about it. You just are living your life trying to pay your bills, survive in this capitalist hellscape. So like, I have that being like, I see why this is happening and I see why it's like a little out of my control. So it's like, I don't carry the judgment or that resentment. So I feel like this is why it's a little easier for me when it can, it is something that is very hard for people because the digital self and the real self, a lot of feel, people feel that anonymity and they are, they feel that empowerment to kind of project and put their issues out there and especially when a lot of those issues are ugly because, you know, we're going through this world, we all experience these ugly things that shape us and we don't often have the tools or the space to build the compassion to work through them. 
And so, especially because the instant gratification, it's so easy for people to be hateful or to people to shut down and break down and just put that on the creator, especially in parasocial relationships. So like, yes, people have, you know, called me a disgusting whale. People have been like, I thought this was Vermont. And, you know, you knowing the racial undertones of them being like, why is a black person telling me about Vermont? They're not from Vermont. I'm like, guess where my address is, Vermont. And so those dark spots can really be overwhelming, especially when you think about the privilege and the access and like the comparison to other creators that are where you want to be or saying a narrative that's not yours and people are just like putting all these things together. And I will never say that it's not hard and it's not for everyone. But I am very grateful that I understand that like that's not my issue. I see the comments and I will, I will be affected by them. I feel my emotions, but I'm also like, yeah, I feel these emotions. I felt them, I see them, and I'm gonna move on because at the end of the day, I'm making this for me and my homies and I can always order a really good meal from China Express. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, I, I think I maybe would want to give you the opportunity to speak to your homies and hey, say, homies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, to emerging creators, yeah. emerging people of color, and all these other identities that have so been underrepresented. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people wanting to step out into that scary arena of social media and media in general? In that. This will sound mean, and it is mean. It might sound beautiful because it is beautiful. The world is a messy, gross place, but so are gardens, so are mulch, so are earthworms, so are blooming flowers. It all comes together to create this ecosystem. And if you want to step out into it and you think it's because oh, I have too, like, I'm suffering from depression. I have ADHD. I have, like, I don't have the language of someone who went to school for it, or I, like, colorism's got you down. It will try to beat the ever-loving crap out of you, but this world thrives through community. Survival of the fittest isn't the biggest, baddest person. It is the people who find the solutions and find the community to thrive together. And we are social animals and you are deserving and competent and smart enough to break into these spaces that are trying to exclude you. Those are the spaces problem, not your problem. So find your community, find people that give you strength, that inspire you, whether that be parasocial that you look up to them or people in your community that you can reach out to and learn from or create with because whether you are you know aiming to take down Fox News or you're trying to you know split rent three ways in a dinky little studio to make a little zine just for yourself and maybe your cousin that would love to see it that is enough you are enough and the amount of joy you create as long as it brings you joy and it makes the world what you think a little more beautiful, that's the perfect project. If you like this and want to see more, watch the rest of the series. Thank you for watching and please vote.